Wasn't that beautiful? You remember uh, last week, we talked about framework, having the right framework. And just in two minutes, Dr. Sharps provided us a framework. Carbohydrates, protein, fat. It just blew my mind. It just blew my mind. <laughs> framework. You get that framework, how easy is it? I, you know, I've never heard that before. I know, I know one thing for me that uh, mixing carbohydrate and fat together or carbohydrate and protein is death. It's just terrible. I just can't handle it. And I was raised uh, in a Seventh-day Adventist uh, home. And you know what they fed us on? TVP and gluten steaks. <laughs> no wonder I had a sickly childhood. <laughs> it was bad. It was really, really bad. I wasn't good to be around when I was eating that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. That was, uh, that was tremendous. Well, let's, uh, let's kneel and, and pray. Father in heaven, we just thank you so much that we can come on the Sabbath. We, we sense your spirit and by faith we open ourselves to the reality of the double portion of your spirit that is promised to us at this time. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you that you have written our names in the book of life and that you have forgiven us of our sins. We believe all of this by faith. I pray that as we speak now that you would lead and guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that uh, my wife doesn't like to get up the front and speak, but I know that uh, you were blessed by what she had to say. Uh, and you can, you can get a little bit more understanding of the, the true powerhouse behind my ministry uh, and, and what's going on there. So I just wanted you to be exposed to that, and I thank the Lord. It's uh, very evident that he, he put us together, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm very thankful that he spoke straight to me, <laughs> and uh, never had a doubt, never had a doubt from the day we were married, not one doubt ever, and that's a, that's a tremendous, tremendous blessing. Praying about uh, our context of our presentation... What I'm going to ask us to do this morning is I'm, I'm going to give our young, sweet mic runners the day off. I just want you to listen uh, to, to what I want to share with you. And if you do have questions, uh, come to me afterwards so we can get through the material. Uh, I, I like to get feedback. I really like a, a dynamic environment. I, I love to bounce off people and it gets me thinking. Uh, because I know where I'm going in my thought process, but like sometimes when I'm sharing something, not everyone knows where I'm going and the, and the direction gets lost uh, and it's not as easy for others. So if, if we can just, uh, just, I'll work through the material and if there's some things that come up, uh, then come and talk to me afterwards because I always want to learn, I always want to grow in my understanding. I, I want to come back to our presentation from last week and I want to recap some points. One of the key principles of learning is repetition and expansion. So we want to repeat where we've been and we want to expand uh, on, those, uh, on those principles. Uh, and so last week we were talking about the first angel's message. And if you look in... Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 gives you the context. Verse 6 gives you the context. The framework. The framework is provided for this message in, in Revelation 14, 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel. Everlasting gospel. This is the context. This is what's so important. This is the piece that's been missing. And when you have the wrong framework, uh, as we say in the food industry, you get a lot of gas. So uh, 
and they don't smell good. So you get the wrong context, and that's what's happening. That's what's happening in the Adventist movement. You're getting the wrong context. You're not getting a correct understanding of the everlasting gospel, which came to us when? When did the everlasting gospel come to us? Eighteen eighty-eight. The context for the gospel, the the, the the framework for the gospel. The gospel was provided. The pieces of the puzzle were given to us in 1844. We were provided. But the context in which to put the pieces of that puzzle didn't come until 1888. The Lord sent a most precious message through elders Wagner and Jones. It presented Christ... What, did it, what is the rest of the quote? Do you remember? <laughs> As the uplifted saviour, it presented righteousness by faith in the surety... This is what it presented, the everlasting gospel. And what we looked at then after that is once we have that context, and the context was this. That, ad, uh, that Christianity had understood that the old covenant was a time context, that people before the cross were in the old covenant, they were saved by obedience to the law, and that people in the New Testament were saved by grace. And so, either God had a change of mind. My mother even said this to me recently. She thought, well, tried it one way, didn't work, so let's try something else. So we can get that to work. A lot of people may have that, that understanding. That, uh, that's the way it's been taught. Didn't work, the law-based approach, so let's try the, the grace-based approach. Uh, but the 1888 message emphasized the fact that Christ was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world and that the grace of Christ has been available from the foundation of the world as it says in 2 Timothy 1, 9 and 10. The grace which was available from, from then. We're just re recapping. And so Jones and Wagner introduced to us the fact that the old covenant, I'll read it to you again, in this booklet out of his series on the two covenants. Again, once you get framework, just like we heard from Dr. Sharps, that framework, it just revo it's revolutionary once you get it. And it's so simple. The best principles are the simplest principles. This is what Jones said in 1900. Thus the covenant from Sinai brought them, them, the Israelites, to the covenant with Abraham. The first brought them to the second. The old covenant brought them to the new covenant. And thus the law, which was the basis of that covenant, the broken law, was the schoolmaster to bring them to Christ that they might be justified by faith. So the old covenant, as Wagner says, as I've written in the book, discarding Augustine's covenant glasses, the old covenant is an experience. It is the promises that we make to God I promise you, all that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. That's the Old Covenant. There's no forgiveness in the Old Covenant because you've promised to do the deed. You've promised to do what is right. And God allows us to go through that process. There is no other way because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so we go through that process of, I promise God. But finding fault with them, as it says in Hebrews chapter 9... The new covenant is established upon better promises. Exodus chapter 6, that was the original plan. Exodus chapter 6, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Seven I wills that God promises to do for his people. I will bring you out. I will bless you. I will give all these things to you. All that he wanted them to do was to do what Jesus did on the day he was brought forth from the Father, and that was to say, Amen. That's it. It's the new covenant. It's as, it's as simple as that. So, what we're experiencing is that the old covenant is leading us into the new covenant. And the old covenant must be complete in its work. You must be brought to the position of death in your old man in order to receive newness of life. You cannot be born again unless you die. You cannot lay in the coffin and then jump out. That's not being born again. 
That's, that's being, as the Spirit of Prophecy says, that's being buried alive and coming out the same way that you went in. And so you have to die to be born again. That's the simple process. To, to, and in order to die, this is the, the, the simplicity of it in Romans chapter 5, verse 20. We're just, we're just covering these points. Uh, repetition is good for the soul. Uh, Moreover, the law entered in the context of the old covenant for the purpose that the offense might abound. I, uh, <laughs> I can use the health illustrations. You know, when, uh, when, you st when you start to detox, I remember when I, was, when I did that 23-day water fast, uh, for, the, uh, for the first few days I felt a bit of hunger and then, and then after that I wasn't hungry at all. I didn't, I didn't feel anything. After eight days, I could smell a sandwich from 50 feet. I wasn't hungry. I, I just, went, what? That smells really good. And then at day 12, my body just went into, oh, it was really, oh, I thought I was going to die because my body started to eliminate and get rid of all this stuff. You know, that's the old covenant. You know, it's just, you feel like you're going to die, but the better... <laughs> The more that you eliminate, the better you come out when you're resurrected and you come to newness of life. So uh, when I got to day 23, I said, I've had enough. I'm <laughs> but uh, when I had the, the live cell analysis, all my cells that were jagged and all over the place, they were nice and round and they were zinging around everywhere and uh, I was, I was uh, yeah, doing a lot better. Old and new covenant, resurrection. And the challenge is that when you... When you enter the Old Covenant, when, well, when you are in that process, the Old Covenant, the point is that you get told, you get revealed to you that you are wretched, poor, miserable, blind, and naked. And the natural man doesn't like to hear this. He doesn't like to hear that this is the way we are. And, and, and sometimes we go, yeah, okay, yeah, I accept that. And then you try and move on, but the problem's still there. You haven't dealt with the problem, and it comes back again. You are wretched. Miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the voice gets louder and louder and louder and you get knocked down and knocked down and knocked down until finally you accept that's what you are. And the only reason that you can accept what you are is because you see something better. You see something better in the, in the, the, the arms of Jesus that he's promising you something better and that he's willing to forgive you He's willing to forgive you. I'm, I'm not condemning you. I know what you are. I know all this about you. I'm not condemning you. You're condemning you. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus to those who walk after the Spirit. There is no condemnation. Uh, and so we short-circuit the process. When God comes close to us, when we have a hard day, when we have a difficult experience, when we blow up, when we lose our cool, when we do all those things, the only thing that God wants to do is give us grace. That's what he wants to do. We're the ones that want to beat ourselves up, crawl up the staircase like Martin Luther, flagellate ourselves, beat ourselves up, and try and atone for our sin, do something ourselves in order to atone for my bad behavior, or blame somebody else. Blame somebody else. Well, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have done this. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she did it, and then I ate. They're the two things. You either beat yourself up or you beat somebody else up. That's... That's, that's the way it is. And it's all so unnecessary. Moreover, the law entered that defense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. This is the point that we, we need to get to. Uh, and this is the context that we're looking for when God's people, if you come over to Revelation chapter 3, that the, the seven churches of Revelation, that the brethren that were in the church of Philadelphia... In Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Into the angel of the church of Philadelphia, we're talking from the period of 1798 to 1844. This is the historical period that it's talking about. These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth. What is that referring to? That's referring to the movement into the door was open there was a door open into the holy place 
Door gets shut there, door gets open here, Christ goes into the most holy place in 1844. Now, when, when Christ goes into the most holy place in 1844, God's people by faith follow Christ into the most holy place. As they come in, what do they see? They see the law. There's the mercy seat, but they also see the law. Because that's how they saw the Sabbath shining more brightly than all the others. And when the law enters, it causes sin to abound. And so when sin abounds, this is the point we need to make. When sin abounds, Philadelphia becomes Laodicea. Because the diagnosis is upgraded. This is the big point that we're we're making here. Philadelphia, in going into the most holy place... They were not fully aware of all the issues that they were dealing with. And so when they come into the most holy place, they recognize that they didn't have a correct diagnosis of themselves because they they didn't understand the Sabbath. They didn't understand the health laws. They didn't understand the statutes and the judgments. They didn't understand any of these things. But then when they see them, they realize, whoa, we have a problem. And so what did Adventism do? Well, they got very good at debating and exposing everybody else, and they worked up their, you know, well, well, let's focus on everybody else. Let's focus on the daughters of Babylon. Let's show show how bad they are. Babylon is fallen. Not dealing with their own issues, not dealing with the issues that they've got within themselves, and they became as dry as the hills of Gilboa, and the president can say, we haven't lost a debate in 20 years. Uh, We've put those turkeys on the ground. Very good. It's pride, not knowing that they're miserable, poor, blind, and naked, not getting this point. And then this message came in 1888. And so we come back to Revelation chapter 14, just providing context to get a a correct framework. And here are the four points again in the first angel's message. Fear God. This message came early to the Adventist pioneers because most, many of the leaders were from the Christian connection. When God was involved in his recruitment program, our brethren today would say God chose poorly because he chose a lot of these non-Trinitarians. Why did he choose them? Well, it's in the context of fear God, that, as we talked about last, last week, that it is in the inheritance of the begotten Son that the true principles of agape are revealed, the agape of God. The Son of God rules on the throne of His Father with a spirit of gratitude. He rules by divine privilege, not by divine right. When we say right, we say, I assert myself to sit on this throne. That's not how the Son of God operates. He rules by divine privilege. He operates by divine privilege because the Father has made the Son equal with Himself. Eight Testimonies 268. He made the Son equal with Himself, and so the heart of the Son is filled with agape because the Father has filled Him with all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And so in receiving all the fullness of His Father's gift, the Son's heart is filled with gratitude. And it's that gratitude that holds the whole universe together. It is that gratitude in the heart of the Son that flows out of the Son. He is the fountain of life. He is eternal life. Because out of Him flows that gratitude, that blessing, as well as His obedience and submission to His Father. It's the critical ingredient for the Gospel. To understand agape. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. In this... 1 John, and sorry, I'm just, we're recapping, so I'm just going fairly quickly. 1 John 4, 10. In this was manifest the love of God towards us, in that He gave us His Son. I'm paraphrasing shortly, but uh, you get the point. So the fear God, understanding who God is. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is to keep His commandments. All of these things are related to fear God. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. At the last part, that was the end of all of Solomon's enterprises. That was the conclusion of the matter. Fear God, 
keep his commandments, all connected. And then we say, give glory to him. Give glory to him. Give glory to God. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the mighty man in his might, but let him who glories, glories in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord that exercises loving kindness. This is the Lord. Proclaiming the name of the Lord. The name is a character. Exodus 34, 5. Proclaiming the name of the Lord. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth. And will by no means clear the guilty supplied word. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation of them that hate him. Not just simply pouring it out, but on them that hate him. So the issue of giving glory to him, understanding his character, and the point that we came to last week, uh, before I step into that, let's, let's come to the hour of his judgment. Hour of his judgment. Jesus says in Matthew 7 to, as you judge, you will be judged. When the judgment comes, 1844, end of the 2300 day period, the, the emphasis, God's people go into the most holy place, the law is revealed to them, which is a transcript of his character. So they're being exposed to the character of God more fully within the law. And then Jesus says, as you judge, you will be judged. So it is our judgment of God that will determine the judgment that we ourselves receive. How does God do that? How many many businesses and corporations and situations operate like that? As you judge, you will be judged. As you judge me, that's what will judge me. Your perception and judgment of me will judge you. That's quite full on, isn't it? And then worship him that made. These were the four key points. Worship him that made which is a call to the worship of the Sabbath or worship through the Sabbath, worshiping the creator of the Sabbath, the Sabbath principle by which the Spirit comes. And we've talked about the Sabbath fountain, the sevens multiplying by sevens out and out. And when God's people take full hold of these four points, who God is, the Father and His Son, and their agape spirit, what His character is like, The judgment process, that we are the ones involved in judging God in order that that judgment would fall upon us and an understanding of his spirit through the Sabbath. And of course, this is all in the context of the everlasting gospel, the cross of Christ and the love of the Father. When these four points in this context are understood, then Babylon falls. This is is what will cause. It's a chemical reaction in the spiritual world that will take place when these four things uh, come about. And so we need to come back. This is the, many of us have been on this journey. We understand the fear God. There are still many who are understanding the identity of God and his son, but not understanding the why, the agape, the love that exists between father and son, the relationship between the Father and Son. And this is the critical component that allows you to move into the character of God and understanding who He is. So many people are not getting this particular point, but rather simply choosing to, because we believe in God and His Son, we now have leverage on the organization to say, we worship the true God, you worship a false God. You are fallen, we are not. And in doing that process, they short-circuit the process and bail out of the program. There's no use in doing this until you embrace the spirit of what that relationship is between those two people. What is the spirit of the Father and the Son? This is the key point, isn't it? What's the quality of the spirit in the Father and the Son? That indeed is what we would refer to as the heavenly trio the Father, the Son, and their spirit of agape. This is the key point. The three great powers of heaven that the spirit of prophecy 
refers to. So we need to come back to the give glory to him because this is a sticking point for us. And uh, we began to address this last week. Come to uh, John chapter 17, the giving glory. And I just want to lay out for you some, some points on this issue. <clears throat> John 17, verse 4. Jesus says, I have glorified thee, where? On earth. Meaning, during his 33 years while living here on earth, in that time period, the definition of the glorification of God's character took place within that 33 years. And so, I just want to read you a few statements. I've got it written in the booklet here, the ministration of death. And just listen to this, because this is, this is critical. God has left nothing undone that he could do for us. He gave a perfect example of his character in the character of his son. What kind of an example? A perfect example in the character of his son. And it is the work of Christ's followers as they behold the incomparable excellency of his life and character to grow into his likeness. This is, this is mission critical now because whatever character we perceive in Christ and of the Father, whatever that character is, by beholding that character, we will be changed into that image. So this is mission critical, that we understand what that character is. As they look up unto Jesus and respond to his love, they will reflect his image. Review and Herald, February, February 15, 18. 98. How much of the character of God was revealed in his son? How much? The Spirit of prophecy will tell you. The whole character of God was revealed in his son. All of it. Not one aspect of his character was missing. And so it is through the lens of that 33 years that we need to look into the rest of scripture to understand what is going on in the rest of the Bible. If we were to, and I can read you a couple of other statements, just uh, in Our Merciful Loving Father, which is a compilation of Spirit of Prophecy quotes in reference to the mission of Jesus. I just want to read you uh, a few points. It, this is bottom of page 12. It was for the purpose of giving to man a perfect representation of the character of God that Jesus came to our earth. Do I need to say anything else? Is that, <laughs> is that pretty clear? I mean, she says it again and again and again and again. When he said, it is finished, Spirit of Prophecy tells you, he finished revealing the character of his father in full. That's what he finished. He got to the end of that race without marring the character of his father in any way. And so in the Gospels of Jesus Christ, we have to us been given the most precious revelation of our Father in heaven. He glorified the Father on earth. He gave glory to the Father. And it is our responsibility in responding to the first angel's message to give glory to him as Jesus gave glory to him. Which means we must behold Christ in full and allow that spirit to come into our lives, to take over us, to give glory to Him. And this is where we come into this conflict and we've been sharing some of these stories. And I want to address um, another story in, the, in Scripture. Now, let's read through the lens of Scripture in the, in the life of Christ. It's in... It's in John chapter 8. When you want to understand the principle of stoning, of stoning, we look through the lens of Christ as to what the other principles of what stoning was all about. Okay? So, we read, it says here in verse 3, 
And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. In the very act. These guys obviously knew the program. They knew what was going on. They knew the situation. They knew when to catch this woman out. Maybe they were part of the program as to why. And they had placed her in that situation. They caught her in the very act. Now, what's interesting, of course, for this woman is that the Torah does say that if you commit adultery, what should be happened? What should happen? You should be stoned to death. So the law, the Pharisees, are actually working for Jesus in that they, in their eagerness to take this woman, they throw her at Jesus' feet. Now, what would be a better place to land than at the feet of Jesus? The law did its work. The law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. This woman was brought to Christ, even though these Pharisees were not from Christ, they were not on his payroll, they were not in any way related to his spirit, God still uses that situation to bring this woman to himself. That's smart. (laughs) And so, it says, Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. Now it's interesting that there is, and I can't remember where it exactly is in the Torah, but there is a a, a sacrifice to be offered where dust is taken from the floor of the temple. And uh, you you remember that one? Jesus is not just doing something out of... Relating this to the law. And he's writing out on the floor of the temple the dust in the temple. And so, so when they continued asking him, he lifted himself up and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Here's the law giving, the lawgiver giving you the context by which someone is capable and qualified to stone someone. You must be without sin. How how many people then are qualified to stone people? No No man. No man is qualified to stone people. That's what Jesus is. He's he's quote this. He has an understanding of the law. He did not come to change one jot or tittle of the law, and he's. He's giving us the interpretation of the law that you must be without sin if you are to stone people. That's the first thing. We're looking at the lens through Jesus Christ. So there is no one qualified to stone people, which leads us to the question, why is there stoning in the Old Testament? Very good question. And again, he stooped on the ground and wrote on the ground. Verse 9, And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one. How sad. How sad. As he's writing out their sins, why didn't they come and kneel beside this woman and ask Jesus for mercy? But rather than accept the work of the old covenant, rather than accept the conviction of sin in their lives, they left and they went their own way. They short-circuited the process. Jesus was not simply trying to embarrass them. I remember reading this uh, story uh, as a young person on that there's Jesus riding on the sand and he's sticking it to the Pharisees S- saving that woman no he was trying to reach them he was speaking out to them uh, and reaching out for them as well because he loved the Pharisees just as much as he loved that woman that was caught in adultery and probably framed by the Pharisees and so we see that it says And they went from the eldest even to the last. Judgment begins at the house of God. He starts at the beginning and he is systematic and orderly going down, reaching the first and going down, pleading that they would come and ask forgiveness. But they don't, they leave. And maybe in this case they may have committed the unpardonable sin. We don't know. But they certainly had hardened their hearts against the truth at that point. And Jesus was left alone And the woman standing in the midst, midst. when Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? 
Hath no man condemned thee? Beautiful. She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. This is the lawgiver. Neither do I condemn you. This is the whole purpose of the stoning process. The whole purpose of the law is interpreted by Jesus Christ. His whole purpose of giving this commandment. It wouldn't have mattered what you had put in the Torah. You could have put burning, flaying, skinning alive, decapitation, death by a thousand cuts. It wouldn't have mattered what you put in there because there was only one reason that the condemnation was there. To bring you to Christ in order to receive mercy. That's the only reason. And so we see that stoning, as it says in Exodus 8, 23, 24, that stoning was an Egyptian practice which the Israelites took with them out of Egypt. Many of the Israelites had worshipped the sun, moon and stars. They had put their children through the fire like the Egyptians. They were practicing the Egyptian abominations. And this perception of God that they had, they took with them. And as Jesus said in Matthew 7, 2, as you judge, you will be judged. They judge that God stoned people, so God put that in the Torah. In the founding documents of their nation, God allowed them to be co-authors of the document. You can put whatever you want in there. I'll sign it off. Because there's only one thing I'm interested in, and that's mercy. You put whatever you want to put in there. You, you, you tell me how you want to kill people, I'll put it in there. And then when you bring people to me, I'm going to give them mercy. That's the plan. That's the way it was planned to do. But if the people that were following this program were not listening to God, were acting on what they thought to be God, well, then there were some people in the Old Testament that were getting stoned to death, weren't there? Let's come to Leviticus 24. Leviticus 24. There was a man... He was a half-caste. He was part Egyptian, part Israelite. He was not one of them. He was not a real Israelite. He was a fake one. It says, verse 10, And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel, and this son of the Israelitish woman a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son, this is verse 11, blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed, and they brought him unto Moses. And his mother's name was Shelemith, the daughter of Dibri, of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. You want to know the mind of the Lord? There's the mind of the Lord. Take him out and stone him. That's what the Bible says. So what's going on here? Jesus, in the New Testament, they throw him at his feet, and he says, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. They all leave. He gives them mercy. Has Jesus changed his mind? Oh, yeah, that's when we come back to Augustine. We go, oh, that's old covenant. That's old covenant. That's when they used to stone people. But thank God we don't do that anymore. Not in the everlasting gospel. Same gospel. So this is what we need to understand about these pronouncements in Scripture that we think that God is speaking. But this is the key about the ministration of death. James 1.23. Oh, we, we covered this last night. James 1.23, we know this. It says, the hearer of the law, he reads the word of God and he sees his own natural face in a mirror. These people are not in the new covenant. They're in the old covenant. They have promised God all that the Lord has said we will do. In the old covenant, God is speaking to you your own thoughts. These people knew that this man was a half-caste. He wasn't really one of them. And when, they, when he blasphemed the name of God, in their heart was stone him. So what does God say? As you judge, 
you will be judged. I'm reflecting back to you your own thinking. Now notice something very interesting in, in the text here, in Leviticus 24. He, go, he goes through, verse 15, And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Whosoever curses his God shall bear his sin. Now what did Jesus say in the New Testament? All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men. Well, is this saying, well, except, in, except if he's half Egyptian? That doesn't apply. All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, except what? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? The, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when the Spirit of God is speaking into your mind saying, you're in a lot of trouble here, son. Ask for mercy. Ask for mercy. Beg for mercy. And you push that voice away. There's no hope for you then. You, put, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit because God is ever merciful. The mercy of the Lord endureth forever. The Spirit is always wanting to give you mercy and the Spirit is saying, mercy, mercy, and you push that away and you don't ask for mercy, you're going to get the consequences. The iniquities of the fathers, the iniquities of the Israelites who had adopted the practices of the Egyptians was now being visited upon their own people. Now we find that the Pharisees in the Gospels get caught in their own snare. Why didn't they want to come out and openly take Jesus? We can't do that. The people will stone us. They're caught in their own system. They're caught in their own trap. So they can't, we can't do that because going, people are going to stone us. Verse 16, And he that blasphemed the name of the Lord, he shall surely be put to death. And all the congregation shall certainly stone him as well as a stranger as he that is born in the land when he blasphemeth the name of the Lord shall be put to death. Oh, and there's a little footnote in verse 17. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. What? Oh, just before you take him out and stone him, just remember, if you kill anybody, you'll be put to death. <laughs> that's an interesting little footnote in there, isn't it? If you kill anybody, you're going to get put to death. So when you think about going and stoning this guy, maybe you should say, you know what? I was cussing the other week in the back of the tent and no one heard me. I'm no better than this guy. Maybe I need mercy as well. We need to encourage this guy. We need to pray for this guy. We need to encourage him to seek for mercy because we, oh, we don't believe in a merciful God. Oh, bad luck. Got to kill him. See the problem? <laughs> See the problem in, the, in this case? <laughs> now what, what's sad about this process is you read through this because you come to the end, you know, you're looking for the end of the story. Verse, uh, let's come to verse, it says verse 19, and if any man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Now, what did Jesus say about this in the Sermon on the Mount? You have heard it said. What did he say? Matthew 5. Verse 38. Matthew 5, 38. You've heard it said that it hath been said. You have heard that it hath been said. That's interesting. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Is Jesus contradicting the Torah? This is the Torah giver speaking here. He's giving the true intent of the law. The true intent of the law was to bring people to a point of asking for mercy. That was the intent of the law. So that when a congregation was brought to the point where they're actually standing there with a dirty big rock in their hands, they're going to smash this guy's skull, they're going to think, hang on a minute, I'm no better than this guy. What am I doing with this rock in my hand? We all need to ask God for mercy. 
And of course the question comes up, yeah, but what are you going to do with this evildoer? I mean, if you let him live, he's going to keep doing his evil and he's going to cause poison and all these things are going to happen. What are you going to do with this guy? Justice needs to be served. God's character tells us, how does he punish the sinner? He causes the iniquities of the fathers to be visited upon the children under the third and fourth generation. This guy died because of the sin of the Israelites in picking up the sins of the Egyptians was visited upon this man and he died. Natural justice. Boy, God's smart. The way he works these things. Way, he knew the way this was going to be played out. He knew that if this individual continued in the frame of mind that he was in, it was going to cause a tremendous problem within the camp. And so he let natural justice play itself out. Their perceptions of God played out in the destruction of this individual. But all the while, he was offering them mercy and a different way out. Oh, by the way, if you kill any man, you will be put to death. They seem to have forgotten that part. Because as we go on, as we read in verse 23, And Moses spake unto the children of Israel that they should bring him forth that hath cursed out of the camp and stone him with stones. And the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded. How sad. Nobody there to put up their hand and say, we need to pray for this guy. This guy needs mercy. We need, we need to pray that he's going to repent. And what if he didn't repent? And what if they all said, no, we're all sinners. We can't do this. We can't do this. And the man still remains unrepentant. There is a thousand other ways that God could have brought this to a completion, including his blasphemy, his rebellion against God, as we said last night, could have caused the earth to respond to this man. His influence on the earth would come back on him whether she-bears come out and destroy him or whatever. It doesn't matter. But they wouldn't have had to violate their conscience. And so when those people stoned that man to death, we don't want to get too graphic. But there those people have in their minds a picture of this man with his head smashed in and blood everywhere. And they have to carry that image in their heads for the rest of their life. And knowing deep in their hearts, you know what? I've done the same thing as this guy. I could have been that guy. That's bad. And so, do we see the ministration of death? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what penalty is put in the law. God's purpose is to bring you a conviction of sin, that all the world may be stopped and become guilty before God. That's the purpose of the old covenant. The, the, the thing that it says in Deuteronomy 32, 39 is, I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. It's not one and, oh, bad luck, you don't get the rest of the story. It's both together. He wants to kill the old man. Nowhere in this story did this man have any conception of the mercy of God that he could put out his hand and say, Father, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's no record of it. No one in the camp was asking for mercy for this man, neither this man for himself. So this man died under the old covenant. The sins of the fathers were visited upon the children under the third and fourth generation. And why was the mind of the Lord expressed this way? Why was it expressed this way? Because he was mirroring back to them what they were thinking. And this is the point we need to understand. This is the critical part of the piece of the puzzle that we're missing in reading these stories in the Old Testament. Look at another story. Deuteronomy. No, come to, come to Numbers chapter 13. If you read Numbers chapter 14, you, you, you get the reason why that... Nearly all the children of Israel died in the wilderness. Why did nearly all the children of Israel die in the wilderness? Because they thought God wanted to kill them in the wilderness. So they got their wish. They had a death wish. And they got it. Oh, you brought us out to kill us. You brought us out to kill us. Okay, out of your own mouth I will judge you. It says in Numbers 14, you're all going to die in the wilderness. Because that's what you judged. You judged it, you got it. But God wouldn't have said it like that. 
God would have been in agony and tears, crying for his children, pleading, sobbing. Why don't you listen to me? And now you're going to have to have what you asked for. You asked for it. I don't want to give it to you, but you keep wanting it. So you have to die. Numbers 13. And the Lord spake unto Moses, Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, of every tribe of their fathers. Shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. So God's commanding them to go and spy out the land. Right? So come over to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Verse 22. There just happens to be a little footnote to this story as Moses is recounting their experience. It says, And you came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, and they shall search out the land, and bring us word again by what way we must go up, and into what cities we shall come. And this and the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe. So whose idea was it to spy at the land? It was Israelites themselves. They decided, God said, go up and take the land. They said, uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, can we go and spy it out first? We'd just like to kind of check this out a little bit first. It's not that we don't trust you, but that we, well, it is. They didn't trust him. Spying out the land was actually an act of distrust by the Israelites in God. And so when you read Numbers chapter 13, it sounds like God is the one who is initiating the process. But it's actually he is responding to what they are. They, they are requesting this and so God mirrors back to them their own thinking and he expresses back to them their own thoughts. You, you see the process? So <laughs> this, is, this is the amazing thing about the stories in the Old Testament. When you're reading these stories about God commanding the death and destruction of all these individuals, he's actually mirroring back to them the heart of man. And we think this is God, but it's actually man. And God is just mirroring it back. And through reading the, the Old Testament scriptures, every time we read a command of death and destruction, we're invited. What God do you serve? Is this the God that you serve? Or is this actually a reflection of your own character? Are you a hearer of the law? And do you see your own character in the attributes of God? I mean, look at some of the stories. Come to Numbers 11. Numbers 11. When you read Numbers 11, I think some of you, I don't know, maybe, Jim, when you're working in IBM, you might have had a boss like this. But uh, <laughs> Numbers chapter 11. <laughs> and when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. How do you read? What are you reading? God has a brain snap, fire comes out, people get barbecued, it's all in a day's work. I mean, how, what do you do with this stuff? This is, this, this is, how are you reading this? God has placed these things in Scripture to test us, to see what's really, really going on in this story. And it's written in this way, and people say, just take the plain reading of the scripture. You read it plainly. God, people grumble and they complain. They get barbecued. Okay? They get fried. Bang. No call for repentance. No, nothing. Just bang. Down it comes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's it, Daniel. <laughs> and as you, you read in the prophet Micaiah, when the Lord says, who will go and be a lying spirit for us in the mouths of the prophets? And they go, oh, oh, no, I'll go down. Oh, you go. Go and be a lying spirit. Really? What's, what's going on there? Psalm 78, 49. God sends evil angels to destroy people. That's the literal reading of the text. How do you read? How do you read these things? All these things are written there to offer us the opportunity to see whose mind we're operating in. Is he reflecting back to us our natural human thinking? 
Because when people displease me and I get irritated, the natural Adrian wants to fry people. That's my nature, not God's nature. You can own that if you want. Can we save the question? Just, yeah. Thank you. This is a really, really important, a really, really important point in understanding this. God hardens people's hearts. Well, no wonder Pharaoh did what he did, because God did it. He couldn't help it, because God hardened his heart. So that's why. So God did that to him. And as Calvin would have us believe, he raised him up for the special purpose of hardening his heart in order to destroy the Egyptians. To show his power and crush those miserable Egyptians. Yeah, that's more like my nature. That's what my nature is like. But when you look at Jesus, that's not what we're seeing in the scripture. We're seeing something completely different. It's like, what? How does that work? And so we're invited through this ministration of death to realize that God, in his love and mercy, gives men the freedom... And he mirrors back to us our own thinking. This is a critical component in understanding the character of God. He will command the things that draw out of us our own thinking. <clears throat> in reference to the command to destroy. Numbers chapter 21, we've touched on this before. Who was it that initiated the process? In, in the booklet, I think we have it over here. Serpent revealed in Cain and conquest. How many people have, have looked at the Old Testament and used the genocide commands of the Old Testament to justify the genocide that they're involved in in the world today? Well, God commanded it to the Israelites, spare not men, women and little babies. Take your great big sword and stick it into that baby. Are you for real? I mean, that's a very hard sell to an atheist. Numbers chapter 21. <clears throat> and when King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell Israel came by the way of the spies, then he, sought again, uh, he fought against Israel and took some prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. We see here the spirit of Levi and Simeon. Levi and Simeon, their sister was taken by Hamor, or Hamor the, the Shechemite, who took their sister and defiled her. And they said, we're going to sort you people out. You touch our sister, we're going to just decimate you. But they do, it very, they do it through deception. They lie. Okay, you want our sister? Yeah, you're going to all get circumcised. And while you're all circumcised and you're all trying to recover, we're going to just slaughter you. Take your wives and your children and your animals. There's the spirit right here. It's right here in Numbers chapter 21. The iniquities of the fathers are being visited upon the children through generation after generation after generation. And so they say, okay, because when you read... They're constantly thinking that God wants to kill them, that God wants to kill, kill them. They're grumbling, they're complaining, and then they say, okay, God, we need, to, we need to show you that we've got what it takes. You give these people to us, we'll kill them all. Because we know that's what you want. That's the kind of God you are. We know you're a God like this. So we'll, we'll please you. And so after they slaughter them in verse 3, we get to verse 4. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass land of Edom, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. You better believe they were much discouraged. Why were they discouraged? They just the horror movie that they've just been watching and slaughtering all these people. This horror movie's going through their head. No wonder they're much discouraged. Because this is not the Spirit of God. Verse 5 And the people spake against God. Were these people in a covenant relationship with God, a saving covenant relationship with God? They're speaking against God. They apparently do what he commands them to do and they're not happy. They're discouraged and they're complaining against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? They kill and what are they afraid of what's going to happen to them? Of being killed. This is a thought we want to, we want to go over and over again. Thanks to Mel Gibson, not that we want to watch it, pay anything to that. Why couldn't Desmond Doss be killed? One simple reason. 
He wouldn't kill. It's, it's, it's the law. <laughs> he refused to carry a weapon. He refused to kill. So God made sure he couldn't be killed. Put the bead on him. The gun wouldn't go off. The gun would jam. They could have killed him a thousand times over. They couldn't kill him. Because he chose to keep the commandment of God, which says, thou shalt not kill. Desmond Doss understood the sixth commandment. He knew how to interpret it according to the life of Jesus. And so that's why he was saved. And lived to tell the story. And so we see in this story that it's the Israelites. So when we come to Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, we're going to have to wrap it up. We'll just finish off. <laughs> it says, verse 1, When the Lord God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, the Gergesites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. And there's your clue. God says, show no mercy. The Lord is ever merciful. So, is this a reflection? And this is what they said they were going to do to the Canaanites before. We're going to utterly destroy them. We're going to utterly wipe them out. So God mirrors back to them their own thinking. And rather than, rather than think, you know what? We, we don't want to do this anymore. We don't want to kill these people anymore. Uh, and, and they, well, all right, we're going to do it. We're going to wipe them out. We're going to kill them. We're going to destroy them. Now, in, in this booklet here, I have the quote. Did you say something? No, no. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 392. It was never God's intention that Israel should take the land of God, uh, Canaan by warfare. It was never part of the plan. If they had have come into the new covenant, if they had have come into that covenant and followed that through, they wouldn't have had to do anything. How, did, how was God going to deal with the Canaanites? Exodus 23, 27. He would drive them out with hornets. And let's just, let's just get one thing clear with, with the driving out principle. The driving out principle. And I, I wanted to... Can I take five more minutes? <laughs> Come back to Genesis. While you're going to Genesis, I'll just quote it for you, okay? There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his, his angels fought... There was not found place for them anymore in heaven and they were cast out. Okay, why were they cast out? Well, it says in Jude, or is it Second Peter, that the angels who left their first estate, they left. Why did the angels leave? Because like the Pharisees, when Jesus in heaven stood down on the temple floor in heaven and he wrote the sins of the angels, they left. Thus, they were driven out. Thus, God drove them out. How did he drive them out? He tried to convict them of their sins. That's why they were driven out. Jesus didn't grab Lucifer and go, out you go. He didn't do that. He said, Lucifer, you have a problem. You have a sin problem. You need to repent of your sin. And as we know, that it was up to half of the angels, nearly half the angels sided with Lucifer, and only 33% fell, which means 15 to 16% of the angels repented and were accepted back into heaven without any punishment, except one. Those angels realized that they had hurt the heart of their father and his only begotten son. That's punishment. They hurt him. It caused them deep sorrow and pain that they would have hurt the heart of their father in heaven. That's punishment. It's, it's not arbitrary, it's natural justice. It's, it's the way that it works. And so in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve had driven, it says in verse 24, 324, so he drove out the man and he placed 
at the east garden um, at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turn every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now that word keep is exactly the same word as remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now how do you read this passage? I'm throwing you out and I'm going to block your entrance and I've got my sword and if you come anywhere near this thing I'm going to take your head off. Through the, the sword of the word of God through the word of God these angels that are protecting the way, they are guarding the way to get us back to the tree of life. They are preserving the way for us to come back. We left, God convicts of sin, man has to leave, but he's driven out by his own guilt, by his own sense of, of guilt. He's driven out because of it. God preserves a way back to the tree of life through the word of God. Because if God blocks the way to the tree of life, that means there is no opportunity for eternal life for any of us. So this book preserves the way for us to get back to the tree of life. The question that we have to ask again is, how do you read these things? You, you see these things? Or when Jesus, did Jesus, he drove out the money changers. How did he drive out the money changers? It says, when they looked on his countenance, it says in Desire of Ages, when they looked on his countenance, it was like they were being read from top to bottom, every sin, everything that they had done wrong. Why was Jesus doing this? Because he wanted them to fall at his feet and beg for mercy. But instead, they were driven out. They left. This is, how the, this is when you understand the covenants. When Jesus comes to you, when the Spirit of Jesus comes to you, he will convict the world of sin, then of righteousness. That's the two covenants. But if you don't stay for the enduring the sin part, you're never going to get the righteousness. That's the way it goes. So we could go story after story. I hope we've covered some of the key points here in how to read the stories of the Old Testament. Many of the sayings of our Father in Heaven are a mirror onto our own thoughts. <clears throat> and I will leave you with this thought. Abraham lived in a culture of child sacrifice. He was a Chaldean, a Babylonian. They sacrificed their children to their gods. This was not an arbitrary test that came from God. This is, now we're going to test Abraham. He screwed up a few times here. We need to give him something really good. That's not our father in heaven. That's not how he operates. He mirrors back to Abraham the temptations. But when it comes back to him as a command, there's no way out of it. There's no way out of that process, and he had to follow through it. This is what's going on. Because so many people read that. God would command the sacrifice of your own child? What kind of a God is this? It's the ministration of death, written and engraved in stone, to put to death the old man, to give us newness of life. And I would, I would, just, I would just say, in closing, in all my time, in ministry for nearly the last 30 years, nothing has excited me more than this subject of the character of our Father. For me, this is it. This is the sealing message, the revelation of the character of our Father. As one who keeps his own commandments, it is a transcript of his character. And again, we need to understand the word in... in in the commandments is thou shalt not ratsack, which is the Hebrew word for murder. And say, so, well, God moves people. He puts them to death, but he doesn't ratsack them. <laughs> but it says in Numbers 35.30 that the murderer shall be murdered. That's what it says in the commandment, in, in the Torah. So <laughs> why is that? Because it's the mirror. It's the mirror. The murderer shall be murdered. But God doesn't want to murder anybody. The murderer shall be murdered so that he can understand he deserves to be put to death so that he can ask for mercy. That's the whole program. That's what it's all about. And so God keeps his own commandments. I'm pleading with all of us. I'm pleading with those online. Please study this. 
This is the message that will lighten the earth with the glory of the Lord. A revelation of the character of God, of his love for his children. We know, as we read in the statement last week, when the towers in New York fell, Ellen White said, when the great towers, when the great buildings in New York come down, then the fourth angel will begin to sound. We know we're in the time of visitation. We're in the time frame. My appeal to you is to study to show yourself approved, to test whether these things are so. Thank you, darling. <clears throat> so that we can reveal, we can give glory to him. The judgment that is passed by us, like Noah, we will find grace in the eyes of the Lord and be saved in the ark and that we may worship him that made heaven and earth and receive the fullness of his spirit. And when all the ingredients of the first angel's message come, Babylon will fall. And how does Babylon fall? It falls because we cease to drink that wine. This is the ingredients of the formula that will release our minds from a God that kills people because it says you cannot be made perfect in love if you have fear. And if you, if you believe that God kills people, you're going to have serious fear. One more point. <laughs> Sorry. In the time of trouble, when we're wrestling in the time of Jacob's trouble, you read it in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 200, 201, 202. It tells us we're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Now, if you have this belief that God kills the wicked, God kills the wicked himself. When you're in the time of Jacob's trouble and you are shown just how wicked you are, what are you going to do? God's going to kill me. Would to God that he'd killed me in the wilderness. That's what you're going to do. You're not going to understand a, a concept of God that will give you mercy when all of your wickedness, when you realize to its fullest extent that you and I are murderers of the Son of God. That's a pretty high treasonous conviction to have placed against you. And when that is revealed and you see everything that you've done over your life from God's perspective and you see how wicked you are, if you believe that God kills the wicked, then you've just put your hand up to get executed. And you're not going to get through the time of Jacob's trouble. This is serious. This is really, really serious. God does not bring this conviction of sin to kill us. He brings us this conviction of sin to give us mercy and grace because he abounds in goodness and truth. Shall we talk to our Father? Come to me. <laughs> Father in heaven, I just praise you and thank you for giving me the words to express what you placed on my heart. We worship you. I worship you, Father as the commandment-keeping God that keeps his own commandments. We worship you, Lord Jesus, for revealing to us the character of the Father. As your prophet wrote, Jesus never killed anyone. Unquote. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have revealed to us the Father, and now we ask that we would give glory to the Father, that we may face the hour of judgment and see mercy in your eyes and then believe that we can worship him that made heaven and earth and this will shake the foundations of hell itself and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We thank you for hearing this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.